Hi everyone and welcome to another piano comparison here on the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. We have Roland's FP30X with its updated audio outputs, USB audio, all speaker upgrades, all that stuff, and going up against an industry favorite, the Yamaha P125. Uh, we are going to be comparing their sound selection, we're going to be comparing their onboard speakers, we're gonna be talking about the action and other features that are here, uh, and mostly just giving you some perspective points on what we thought of each of them. If it's the first time that you have joined us here on the channel, we would also really appreciate at any point in the video, or maybe even better right now, to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you can be back as a regular viewer of our channel. So without further ado, let's get started with Roland's FP30X versus Yamaha P125 right away. We've done a number of videos with the FP30X, the Roland's relatively new uh, Canadian, about $1,000 American, kind of in that $800, $900 range, 88 note keyboards. The update to the FP30, and we've done a number of videos with the Yamaha P125. Uh, their uh, kind of mainstay, portable, uh, affordable keyboard, uh, really presenting a great offering to the market for a couple of years now, but we've never done them together. And, I went in with some preconceived notions and it certainly has been eye-opening to have these two instruments side by side. Needless to say, uh, there isn't a bad choice between the two, so the point of this video is not going to be to try and tell you that one is better than the other. Uh, it's merely to point out where the advantages are uh, so that if those advantages connect with your imagined use of this instrument. Uh, it's more about what this is the better fit versus what is the better piano. Uh, we're going to talk about the sound first. So if we're talking about speakers first in terms of the whole world of sound, um, Roland definitely takes the cake when it comes to bass presence, but the Yamaha still has some really nice treble clarity. When you try and push the treble on the Roland, it gets just a little bit throaty, like your ear is straining to hear some of that super top end, like 8, 10K and up frequency range. And the thing is, it's still just facing down towards the ground. So uh, through headphones, brilliant. Um, through the onboard speakers, lots of low presence, lots of mid presence, but something a little bit missing from, from the high end when it's sitting next to an instrument that has such awesome uh, treble uh, presentation. So I'm gonna play both of these instruments on the default piano sound to give you a sense of that speaker performance. Now, there are those that would argue that speaker performance on either one of these is a moot point because they're really designed to be gigging boards. Who's ever going to use these speakers uh, in any kind of a professional setting? And of course, they'd be right. There's no way you'd ever use these speakers for anything except personal referencing. So that might include practicing, um, maybe a very, very small rehearsal, uh, you know, anything where you're going to be in a small room with just a very few number of people, but neither one of these speakers has enough reinforcement uh, to do damage you know, on a stage of any size. So yes, you'd be using stage monitors, you'd be going through PA systems uh, and the like, but I still think that it's important 
uh, to be aware of what the speakers bring because they used to be completely an afterthought. Now manufacturers are definitely putting in a lot more consideration to what the onboard speakers should do for you. So I'll start with the Roland first and then we will switch over to the Yamaha. Listen to Yamaha. So now we'll roll the tape back and listen to exactly the same thing, but on the line outs.
Now what's driving those speakers? On the Roland, we have the new BMC chip. That's a faster, better processor that's driving a more complex supernatural piano engine, uh, which is a good thing. And it also ups the polyphony to 256. Now here's the mildly frustrating thing about that. I know that that processor is crunching all kinds of additional nuance around the core tone. And when it first came out, I was able to use the Piano Designer app and access that whole under the hood section uh, that Roland makes available on some of the higher end models. I tried it today and it doesn't work. So we were warned, Roland warned us, I think it's right on their website, you know, functionality might terminate at any time with no warning. And it seems that that's maybe exactly what's happened. So uh, anybody buying the FP10, anybody buying the FP30X should not count on as a critical uh, determining point of their purchase um, that they will be able to use the Piano Designer app. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. Today would not connect. So I don't think the compatibility is necessarily official, but uh, anyway, there's all kinds of stuff going on within that engine. But within the Piano Everyday app and with the onboard controls, you have a similar level of control over some of those parameters as you do on the Yamaha. So the Yamaha allows you to adjust ambience, it allows you to adjust brilliance, uh, and some of the reverb settings, Roland now offers the same, but ugh, I know that if they just enabled that, there's so much more going on there that we could play with on the Roland. Um, but alas, uh, if you pick a Roland uh, FP30X up uh, right now, you may have the same experience I do, which is you can't access the designer app. Uh, the Yamaha uses their pure CF sampling that samples a CF3S, so it's not their newest CFX sample set, but it's still a pretty good one, and goodness knows the CF3S uh, is a really enjoyable nine-foot concert piano to play, and they've captured the essence of that with this four uh, sample layer set uh, within the, the pure sampling. Roland doesn't really reveal too much about the inner workings of Supernatural Piano Engine, so we don't know whether it's a four-layer set or a five-layer set or a six-layer set or whatever it is, um, but I suspect that it's somewhat similar, but Yamaha, and they're similar to Casio in this regard, they do reveal how many sample layers uh, is going on there. So in this case, it's a four-sample layer set uh, with the uh, Yamaha CFS. Then we get to the number of tones that are available. And this is where we really hit one of the big differences between these two instruments. On the Roland, we have a, especially and particularly if you're using the app, in fact, it might be only if you're using the app, uh, you have access to the entire General MIDI 2 sound bank in addition to, uh, I think, 50 or so core tones on there. So you get up into the you know, 300 range in terms of the number of sounds that you can uh, potentially access with the Roland FP30X. But even with just the onboard uh, tones, there's still some really great stuff. So let's listen to some of those uh, additional sounds on the Roland. And I've got the Piano Everyday app up on the phone. So within the acoustic piano range, we have concert piano. <laughs> <laughs> we have concert piano. We have ballad piano. and mellow piano. It's actually quite nice. Here's bright piano. Then we get the uprights, which I'm really not a fan of, to be honest.
because they don't really sound like an upright piano. But I've gone in a diatribe about that on several other videos, so I'll spare you on this one. Uh, but goodness knows, it is my personal opinion that very few digital piano manufacturers actually nail the sound of a good upright piano. It almost always goes to the um, highly affected, out of tune, ragtimey piano thing, or it's this artificially stunted upright piano sound that they capture. So that's all I'm going to say on it. Um, but there's a sample of the acoustic pianos that the Roland has. Um, if we go over to ePiano, they've got all the classics. Six suitcase, Rhodes, the Whirly. Phasey. Clav. Vibes. It's actually a really good Celesta. And then several organs. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, gospel spin and combo jazz organ are probably my two favorites. And then quite a few uh, string options in here. Massive improvement over the string options you had on the FP30. Uh, I really, really quite like the strings. Yeah, you could even bury that in a mix and use that professionally. I mean, it's got that nice balance between the attack and the decay, um, uh, it, you know, creating a nice lush legato texture, but not so badly that you have just constant uh, harmonies running into one another. So it's, it's a tricky balance. I really like what they've done with a lot of those uh, string categories. Pads. got some choir stuff. I don't know. I guess I had Top Gun on the mind. Anybody seen that? It's not out yet. It's about to be out. I don't know. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, I always know that the sound's been nailed pretty authentically when it just triggers uh, like a musical impulse in my brain, kind of like a, you know, like a smell of a great food. And just instantly when it's perfect, it takes you back to the time, oops, takes you back to the time and place where you first experienced it in the memory. 
I have exactly the same type of reaction when I play certain patches and it's just so close to the original that it, it just it's like an instant uh, connection point between those two data bits in your mind. Anyway, and we've got some synth stuff. And then some bass and guitar, and then you get into the entire General MIDI 2 patch. Moving over to the Yamaha, uh, they have 24 sounds. So there's a, a really quite a big difference. Now, if those 24 sounds do it for you, then maybe you're not missing anything. Um, but I do find that as soon as I move off the acoustic piano on the P125, it tends to start, it shows its age against the FP30X. Um, the sounds are just a little more simple. There's not quite as much texture. There's not quite as much, you know, it's like, uh, you know, watching the first Toy Story versus the fourth Toy Story. You ever notice on the first Toy Story, none of the backgrounds are moving. There's no like ripples in the water. It was so new, the technology, that they just didn't have the computing power to have all of that extra subtle texture happening. It's kind of like... It's kind of what I hear there. You know, when I compare this... But it's still a really nice patch to play. Nothing wrong with it. been a while. I think I've said this before, uh, the Yamaha full church organ sound is definitely one of the best out there. Really like it. I don't think that's the key. So on and so forth. So there's another one where the age is there. So a smaller section, still a few really stand out quality options in there, but there's also a few where, um, yeah, you can just tell that it's a, it's a slightly older samples, maybe slightly more simple um, than what you're getting on a newer generation like the FP30X. They're just a little more lush, a little thicker on a few of those categories. So we're going to move on to the next section, which is action. We really appreciate you being with us for this comparison so far, and we will see you in just a minute. So the FP30X uses Roland's PHA4 action, and this has become 
almost their standard bearer action out there. There's like a dozen models that use this action. And there's a good reason. It's a great action. Uh, it's got escapement, it's got a triple sensor, um, and it's got a really nice firm return pressure on it, meaning you could play this thing for hours and never really get tired. Um, it does that without creating a ridiculous um, sense of weight on the way down. So it has this uh, kind of interesting geometry where it doesn't feel heavy on the way down, but yet the return speed is such that your fingers are really aided in coming up on the key. So, uh, you know, people with brains have spent a lot of time on this action and it's evolved throughout the years and I've made no secret that I really like the PHA4. In fact, I think I've made the claim several times that I'd say this is by hands down the best action that you can buy uh, for under a thousand bucks from any of the manufacturers. Uh, and playing it today, uh, you know, my sentiments have not changed. Um, there is a slight texture on the top of the white key, slight texture on uh, the black key. Uh, it does have a little bit more um, uh, kind of looseness to the feel of it than something like the PHA50 uh, or the GHS Yamaha over here. Um, that's an intentional thing. You may like it, you may not, but if you're used to playing on an acoustic piano that isn't brand spanking new, a couple of years old, you'll know that by design, every key is supposed to have about a millimeter worth of play. That's, you know, that's, that's there for a reason, to give your fingers uh, a bit of wiggle room uh, so that as you are uh, playing in, there's, there's some give. Uh, otherwise, you can really get into painful situation if there's absolutely no lateral give to the key whatsoever, which is one of the reasons the GHS has never been right at the top of my list. So we've got the PHA4, triple action, we've got the escapement, um, and they have also, uh, within the sound engine, improved uh, kind of your sense of its dynamic response when you're playing at softer volumes. So it now, even though it's a bit of a, you know, auditory illusion, um, you do have the sense this has become even more sensitive than previous uh, versions of the keyboards that this has been used on. The GHS is a uh, dual sensor, um, no escapement action, which on its own doesn't necessarily affect the physical sense of the key. Right? These are things that uh, you'd feel uh, the escapement if you were playing quietly and very softly, you know, real finesse section, but not so much if you're just playing at a regular volume with the majority of repertoire. Um, the dual sensor you're not really going to notice unless you're playing some pretty vigorous stuff or you're checking MIDI output and you're noticing, oh, this is not quite as even as I would, I would hope. Um, but, uh, so that's, you know, whatever. Uh, if you're not going to be using it for MIDI output, if you're not going to be playing some pretty advanced repertoire, it's a good chance um, that you'd never really uh, care about either one of those shortcomings. Um, the thing with the GHS that I just mentioned is the lack of lateral give. It's a very tight feeling action, which depending on your playing style could potentially be, uh, you know, a, a detriment, a negative, or you might not notice at all. You might start on this instrument, get completely used to this, and then your whole uh, sense of technique forms around what's in front of you. So there's less lateral motion, um, but the thing that is really quite, well, puzzling, I, more point of curiosity, the repetition speed on the GHS is really good. No problem, you know, almost virtually no missed notes there at all, as is the PHA-4. You know, that's, Better than the Kawhi in this price range in terms of repetition speed. Uh, better than Casio in terms of repetition speed. Um, I haven't checked out the Korg, the most recent Korg in this price range, but these are great for repetition speed, probably the best too. But confoundingly, the sense is when you're playing it is that the key coming up actually is happening slower. That's just a slight, slightly more sluggishly even though I know that the actual reality is that the key's coming up uh, just fine because of the repetition speed. So 
I'd be curious if anybody else is a player of the P125 watching this or have already had experience, leave a comment. Let me know whether you've noticed this as well, that there's this sense of just a bit of a mushiness or a bit of a sluggishness to this action coming up. Otherwise, a perfectly functional action, and as I alluded to, if this was what you got used to in the first place, um, most of those things that I was mentioning is that, that I see as kind of maybe minor compromises, you might not at all. So once again, uh, uh, a, a short dialogue between these two actions, which I feel like I'm comparing almost constantly because they are used quite a bit in the entry level points of both of these various manufacturers. We're going to be back for a third section on functions, functionality, stands, all of those other things. Once again, thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you in a minute. The P125 for several years has had a big advantage over its competitors, which is its USB audio interface. And the more people are starting to experiment with recording at home, or just connecting their device to other DAWs and apps and live settings, that USB audio interface is becoming uh, a pretty indispensable to a portion of users. And the FP30 didn't have it. I think the Yamaha was actually the only one that had it in this kind of price category. Well, Roland has now added it to the FP30X, so they both now have USB audio interfaces. And as far as I can tell, there's really no functional difference between the two. They both work uh, perfectly well, uh, sending uh, pure digital audio straight to whatever the host device is going to be. Uh, the FP30 also added discrete uh, quarter inch stereo outputs, which is another thing that it was missing that the P125 had. Uh, so now it has leveled the playing field in that regard as well. Both instruments are able to connect to a computer through uh, a USB. And so there are now more similarities than differences between these instruments. One of the big differences still remains that uh, Yamaha has not equipped the P125 with any kind of Bluetooth radio. So any app connection or computer connection uh, needs to be wired. Uh, if you have the wire, then it's not a big deal. But certainly, you know, wireless generally is, is a really handy thing to have, whether you're talking about computers or any kind of peripheral device. So the Roland does have that Bluetooth MIDI. Both of these instruments are also able to give you auto accompaniment, which is not something I want to forget about. So in addition to all of the other uh, kind of standardy features, they both have a basic recorder on board. I, I don't want to forget that. Um, they both have metronome, they both have the ability to split the keyboard, layer the two sounds uh, between it, there's a transpose, so kind of all of those standard cup holder type features. But they also both have um, auto accompaniment. Uh, Yamaha's got the advantage of having this on the actual instrument without the need for an app. Roland, you need the app to access it, but as long as you're using the Piano Everyday app, this also has a full auto accompaniment. And for people who aren't familiar with what that terminology refers to, that is where you kind of have a band following you around. So your left hand is setting the harmony, you pre-establish whatever the tempo is, it's not gonna follow your tempo around. Um, there are more advanced um, uh, you know, arrangers that'll do that, but not at, not at this level. So you can set the style in which it's going to follow your hand. Is it, you know, is it one note or is it looking for three notes or four notes before it establishes the harmony? Uh, and then there's a number of rhythms that you can choose between. And they're both really good and they're both easy to use. So just as a quick example. That's that. Uh, Roland, you have virtually the same thing, um, but 
you do get it through the app. And then all of the other things that you would expect. Uh, it comes with the music stand. We don't have them on there because it's just sometimes a little ugly to do videos with it, but they both come with it. And you can also get either one of these instruments with a matching stand and a triple pedal set if you want to. Or just use them in slab format like we've got right here. Uh, they are also both available, I believe, in black and white. And depending on whether you want to uh, sort of dig further down the rabbit hole or you're ready to make a purchase, um, as always, you can find links below where you can go uh, and either locate the Yamaha or the Roland for sale. So in conclusion, we've got two instruments that have really pulled in many ways neck and neck, but kudos to Yamaha for having done it several years earlier. In a lot of ways, the features on the P125 were exactly what the Roland FP30 should have had the first time around, which would have made the FP30 the hands down dominant, like don't buy anything else, uh, way back in like 2017, 2018. But alas, you know, 2021, we're finally there. And I would say now, um, overall, the Roland likely has more uh, pluses than minuses if, you, if we line it up uh, more, uh, uh, we've got a, a larger selection of onboard tones, we've got an increased polyphony, we've got the BMC chip creating a lot more texture and thickness to many of those patches, um, and a beefier bass uh, and mid-range with 22 watt speakers. We've uh, fixed the lack of a USB uh, audio interface, we now have the double quarter inch output, uh, this is kind of like the all-in-one unit uh, that can do everything. But it is a couple hundred dollars more than the Yamaha, and uh, they're a little, well, not late to the game. I would say, really, Yamaha was early to the game with several of these features. Uh, like I said, to Yamaha's credit, they already had the USB audio interface a couple of years ago. Uh, they've got some really great treble definition. You know, it has those extra tone ports on the top of it, giving really great treble definition out of this instrument. Uh, and it's super lightweight. Both of these instruments clock in around 30 pounds, but I think the Yamaha might be even just slightly lighter uh, than the Roland. Um, not as advanced in action. We've got the double sensor and lack of escapement and a little bit tight for my liking just generally on that GHS action and fewer onboard tones, but still a really beautiful piano tone if you like the Yamaha sound more than the Roland. Um, there you have it, you know? There may be some features in there where one speaks to you more than the other, uh, but it really is not a case where you've got one badly lagging behind the other. You've got, you know, two of the biggest digital piano companies out there producing a very similar product uh, for more or less a fairly similar price. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the comparison between these two, uh, and I hope this uh, maybe peeled an extra layer uh, of research back for you if you're right in the midst of deciding which one might be a better fit. My name is Stu Harrison. This has been Miriam Piano's YouTube channel, and thank you very much for stopping by. If you really liked the video, if you enjoyed what you heard, uh, if you found it helpful, please subscribe. Um, you know, whether you're in the market or just kind of enjoy nerding out with us piano geeks, uh, we'd love to have you back. So subscribe and hit that notification bell because we really hope to see you again in the comments section or just as a viewer. Have yourselves a great day. We'll see you again soon.